Before you in trouble, if you have your Bible this morning, Proverbs chapter number 30 to start. Proverbs chapter number 30. That'll sort of set the, the precedent, and then we're going to go from there. If you would like to think, be thinking about it, we're going to go to the book of Genesis. That's the first book in the Old Testament. And if you can't find that, we'll pray for you. Proverbs chapter 30, and that's good right there, Chief, thank you very much. Proverbs 30, verse number 11. There is a generation that curseth their father, and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes, and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords, and their jaw teeth as knives, to devour the poor from off the earth, and the needy among men. The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, Give, give. There are three things they are never satisfied, that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say, it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith not, it is enough. The eye that mocketh at his father, and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley, shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Brother Chase, would you please pray and ask the Lord to bless the message. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. The passage pretty much speaks for itself. And while we know that doctrinally it will definitely fit into the tribulation period, I think if we look around, we can see that you find that to be true in the day and time, the day and hour in which we live, not just in the rest of the world, but also in our own lives. The fact that we mock or curse our Father, being our Heavenly Father, is the parallel I'd like for you to see the fact that we tend to be lifted up in pride, the fact that we fit Revelation chapter 3 actually quite well in that he says that they think in their own mind that they're rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, but know not that they are blind and poor and miserable and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me a gold tried in the fire and raiment and I salve and so on and so forth that you not be ashamed. I think if we look at this passage in light of it being Father's Day that we might recognize that we're not where we ought to be. Maybe this morning as you look at this, your relationship with your heavenly father. And that way, I know all of us have a father and all of us have a mother, but I'd like to make a spiritual comparison. And whether you're at odds with your father here on earth or not, can I just bring to your attention this morning, how about whether or not you're at odds with your heavenly father? And if I am at odds with my Heavenly Father, and I know or I wouldn't be in church that I shouldn't be at odds with my Heavenly Father, how do I fix that situation? God provides for us stories in the Bible, examples in the Bible, illustrations in the Bible to try to help us to better understand our need for help along these lines. It's not natural to try to recover something that you've lost when there's no actual benefit to you that you can see on the horizon. Genesis chapter 35, if you have your Bible, there's the story of a man that we know of in the Bible that's called Jacob. Now, as I mentioned to you this morning to just sort of set the story up for you, Jacob and Esau were twins, but not identical twins. As a matter of fact, if there were ever two people that were set diabolically opposed, it's Jacob and Esau. 
The two of them were not alike at all. One of them was a hunter. He was the man of the world. He was, you know, Mr. Good Looking and Mr. Uh, uh, has the physique. He has all the things of being the man's man, uh, a man of the world. He would have drawn a lot of attention in his direction. And he would have been known as a rough and ready sort of a character. If he was a, uh, from Texas, he'd be a cowboy. If he was from Alaska, he'd be a, a, a mountain man or whatever it might be. He was a man's man. Jacob, on the other hand, was mama's boy. Jacob, on the other hand, liked hanging out in the kitchen and staying home and learning recipes and maybe arranging flowers for all I know. I, I really don't know for sure. But, but Jacob liked his mama and Abraham or Isaac liked, his, liked uh, Esau. So what you have to understand is, is that there's two natures right there. There's the man of the world and there's the man that winds up being spiritual. And whether you like Jacob or not, for being a mama's boy, he wasn't chosen because he was a mama's boy. He was chosen from the time God made him in the womb to be the one that was going to inherit the blessing. Now, with that being said, let me say this. He tricked Esau out of his birthright. But he didn't take anything from Esau. Esau willingly gave it up. But some people would say that God condoned that because God had, had given him, uh, they had, had already given him the blessing and therefore Jacob just kind of took things in his own hands, sped up the process and instead of letting God handle the thing, he took it into his own hands to accomplish what God was going to accomplish anyway. That's modern day theology that says it's okay to do wrong to get a chance to do right. That's a lie and that is not something that God would do. God did not condone what Jacob did, nor the way it went about. Jacob's problem, believe it or not, was impatience. Jacob could not wait to have that which God had promised him, but it wasn't the time for him to have it yet. But he decided to go ahead and do it. And I have heard said, well, see, God used that situation to accomplish what he wanted to have done. No, God would not do wrong to get a chance to do right. God would not do wrong to get a soul saved. So you need to dismiss from your mind the humanly way of thinking that it's okay, as I heard one preacher say recently, it's okay for you to lie if, in, in other words, maybe there's a life involved. Well, you better be careful and make sure you fit the two exceptions to the rule and don't make the exception the rule. One of them means you have to be in captivity doing what God tells you to do because of the birth of a nation. And the other one better be because of wartime. But other than that, you don't have an excuse to lie. As a matter of fact, it's one of the top ten. But it's funny in the day and time in which we live where we kind of spin it like Jacob did. We kind of twist it. We kind of say, well, God was going to do this anyway, so it's okay to do wrong. It's all right, you know, to cheat on your taxes to tithe. <clears throat> This is not the Catholic Church and we're not going to put you in jail if you don't tithe. We're not going to uh, not say a prayer for you when you die and we're not going to let you suffer forever in purgatory because there is no purgatory. Amen. But it's not okay for you to not do what they demand of you to do in order to, quote, get a chance. Well, I'm, I'm get, if 10% is good enough for God, then it's good enough for the government. Better be careful about that. You're anywhere from 25 to 45% now if you count all the taxes you pay on everything else. And whether you like how they spend it or not, that's the requirement that you're under right now. Here's what I need for you to understand. You're living in a time and in a generation who don't regard their father's uh, wishes, their father's desire like we talked about, disobedient to parent. Instead of doing what God says, it's like, well, I, I know what it says, but... And Jacob is a perfect illustration of that because what he does is, is he lives a life that, believe it or not, he winds up being a trickster. Now, you know what happens. He finds out that Esau says that as soon as daddy's dead, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go out and I'm going to kill my brother. And mommy hears about it and, you know, they deceive him and they get the little goats and they go in there. And he said, you sound like uh, Isaac, but I mean, you, you, excuse me, you sound like Jacob, but you, you cook like a, uh, Esau. And he gives him the blessing. And Esau finds out about it and says, I'm going to kill my brother, but I'm going to wait because I don't want to be too hard on my daddy. I'll wait for my daddy to die. When daddy dies, I'm going to kill him. Mama hears about it. And so during the middle of the night, he goes out clandestinely and he lights out of there and he heads for a place called Bethel. 
And Bethel is not a place like you might imagine. It's not like the Garden of Eden. It's a very high, very rocky place. It's a windswept place. If you can't get some cover behind the rocks and stuff like that, it's like being out in the middle of the desert. It's a wide open spot there. And when he goes out there to that spot, he's tired, he's worn out, he's exhausted, and he lays down with his pillow as a stone there. And as he does, he sees angels ascending and descending, and he meets God in that place. And him being ever the trickster, him being ever the deal maker, him being ever the one that says, God, if you do this, I'll do that. He says to God, well, now, you know what? I've seen God and this is a fearful place. It's a horrible place in a good way. And so just giving you the backstory, he said, now, God, I tell you what I'll do. If you'll do these things for me, then I'll tithe to you and you'll be my God. <laughs> wow, that's a pretty bold statement to go toe to toe. But do we find a little of ourselves in that? That when uh, we're between a rock and a hard place, we have a tendency to make deals with God. You know, look like the old thing that used to show up, door number one, door number two, door number three, and looking for the great gift behind whatever door it is that you pick. He's literally dealing the cards with the man who is the one that got, the, he's got all of the cards. And he has the audacity to say, now God, if you do this, I'll do that. Well, the Lord decides he's going to bless him anyway and he gets up from there and pours oil on the stone and he makes an altar of the place and he goes through all the rigors of a religious ceremony and things like that. But would you agree with me, that was probably a significant event in his life. For you and me, it'd be something like salvation. The moment that we got saved, and when you get saved, man, it's so fresh, it's so real to you. You cannot wait to, to see what God's going to do for you next. And then off into the far country we go, following along the steps of the prodigal, because you know what? We got everything at home taken care of. And we go over there, and guess what happens? The first thing he does when he enters into Laban territory, he meets Laban's daughter named Rachel. And the Bible says that he kissed her. Not a good idea on the first date. It locked him into 14 years. 14 years before he ever got to kiss her again. I don't know if Laban hit it in the mouth or whatever happened there, but here's the thing that you need to understand. The Bible said he kissed her and he wept. I don't know if it's because that she had been smoking and it was like licking an ashtray. I don't know that it was the moment she smiled. You could tell she'd been doing meth and her teeth looked like burnt popcorn. I don't know if her breath would blister the paint off the wall at 50. I have no idea, but he went to crying. Now, I know the romantic side is he kissed her. He was so overwhelmed. He wept because she was so beautiful, and it was the greatest kiss that he had ever had. It was the only kiss he'd ever had. <laughs> I don't think he looked prophetically at 14 years before I ever get to kiss you again, and he started crying thinking, this is going to cost me 14 years, 360 days per year, however many thousands of days it is before I ever get to kiss you again. But you know what happens. He says, I'll work seven years. And he goes to work for seven years and he goes and gets married. Now, just to kind of show you what a trickster he is, because here's what you miss sometimes going over the story quickly. Remember when he deceived his daddy, his daddy was blind. And remember, his daddy couldn't see, so his daddy was fooled by the sights, the sounds, and the, ver the, the voices that were around him. And so guess what happens? He gets married, and out comes a heavily veiled woman, and he thinks, boy, this is her. I still remember what she looked like. I've seen her on a daily basis. I remember when I first met her at the well. I remember that I cried when I kissed her. Man, I can't wait. We're fixing to be married. And he goes, and he gets married, and it's not till the next morning... I mean, too much schnapps or something. I don't know. <laughs> but it doesn't even look like she said, I do in the ceremony, or she said any vows whatsoever. She is presented to him, and I am trying to be somewhat humorous because Jacob's a lot like us. We have our mind made up. We're so bound and determined it's going to be what we think it is that we're unaware that we're having one pulled on us. He is so consumed with what he wants and what he thinks he's going to get that the Bible says he went through seven years as if it was nothing. And the next morning after he wakes up with the marriage being consummated, he's like, where did you come from? Laban is literally at the door of the tent and said, now hold on a second here, Jake, before you get too upset. We got a custom over here. Man, you fooled me. You lied to me. It was dark. I couldn't see. And the Lord said, really? Really? Is that, is that what it was like, Jake? And, and, and you gave me something? You gave me the older instead of the younger? 
and so all of a sudden he's mad and he's pitching a hissy fit and he's you know gonna he's gonna do something and then as soon as Laban begins to talk to him the Lord says uh, how's that feel Galatians 6 7 how's it feel when what you did to your daddy and to your brother happens to you and so he begins to do the Michael Jackson. He begins to back up. He begins to sort of walk it back. He begins to, you know, okay. He said, okay, well, don't put Rachel on the market. And he said, well, if you want her, you've got to work seven more years. He said, okay, good, I'll take the deal. You ever wonder why he was complicit in that? You romantic people say, because he was so much in love. No, because God was whispering in his ear and said, hey, boy, this is the price you pay when you do things you shouldn't do. And this ain't going to be the end of it. You're going to find out some things with goat skins a little bit later on. But we're talking about the father. So he goes to work and he winds up getting Rachel and they get married. And then a period of time comes when he gets ready to go back. And now he's going to go meet Esau. And he sends all of his family across the river and he wrestles with the Lord in the cornfield and so on and so forth. You know the story there. And then the next day finds out that Esau's not as mad as him as he are, is upset with things. And so he winds up making peace with his brother, tells his brother again, now he's lying. I'm going to go down and I'll meet you at Seir. And he said, listen, I got all this land down here. You can come down here. We'll be brothers. Everything will be good. We'll get it all fixed up. And Jake said, I'll be there. And yet, guess what happens? Come to Genesis chapter 33. He never intends to go to Seir. He goes to Sukkoth. Look in verse number 16, 17. And guess what he does? He's so comfortable where he wants to be that he actually tries to worship God where he wants to worship God instead of where God wants him to worship God. Now remember his original plan, his original word was, I'm going to worship at Bethel. That's my home ground. That's my stomping ground. That's the place where things began. That's a place I'm not going to forget. Yet he buys a piece of ground and builds an altar in a place that is associated with, look in your King James Bible, the field. It's a picture of the world. And the Lord doesn't like altars in the world. The Lord doesn't like all altars that are connected with physically earthly things, things that are connected with their own wishes, our wants and desires. But I got to say for Jake, it was comfortable, it was convenient, it was close by, it was everything that Jacob could hurt because he would, uh, that he could want because it wouldn't hurt him to have to go to church, it wouldn't hurt him to go to the altar. He could still look religious, he could still look like, hey, you know what, I'm a patriarch, I'm supposed to be carrying the blessing and you know, I got it from my brother, but me and my brother, we're good now. Everything's great. We're nice and close. And I know I'm supposed to go to church because optics look good if I don't go to church. And so I better be going to church. I got me an altar. Is that altar where it's supposed to be? Well, you don't really know until you continue to read. Now you're in Genesis 35 and every preacher has preached on this. But I hope to just give you a little bit of, of a different light today. Because this is the hardest trip that many of us will ever make. It's going back to where God told you you should have never left. You see, Jacob's life has now been some 20 years of him doing what he wants to do, where he wants to do it, when he wants to do it, the way he wants to do it. And he understands now that all of a sudden there's some things that have happened. Now, right after that story with Esau comes the story of his daughter Dinah. Now listen carefully, fathers, get a picture of this because he's not really a great role model to set yourself after Jacob. As a matter of fact, Jacob winds up being in the land. Notice now, in 33, he built an altar there. So it's a place of permanence, but you don't recognize by chapter number 34, he is in enemy territory. He is in the land of the Hivites. He is in the land where there are Baal worshipers. There are cannibalistic people that are there. There are people that offer babies on altars. I mean, he is in a whacked out place, but he's got his church. Kind of like Lot pitched his tent in Sodom, right? Because he looked and he beheld the lot, was a, uh, 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 beheld uh, Sodom, it was a well-watered plain. And he said, boy, I can make me some good cows over there and I can make plenty of money. And so blinded by that ambition that he winds up costing himself everything but his two daughters. And his two daughters wind up committing incest with him later on. Stay with me. I'm just getting you caught up to the point. And then there's just about three or four points I'll point out and then we'll go to the barn. Now, if you notice the story, most of them skip from that altar, from the meeting with Esau, and they jump immediately over to Bethel. Yeah, but wait a minute. Something happened 
between him building that altar after him meeting with Esau and going back to Bethel. You know what it was? He had a daughter. And she's in that land. And you understand, Jake is not affected by the people. They're not threatening him. They're not making light of him. They're not uh, causing him any trouble. He's not going to turn into a Baal worshiper. But he has a daughter who happens to get a little too close to the Hivites. And the prince of the king sees her and write it up any way you want to because later he says he loves her, but he took her and sexually assaulted her. He raped her. Didn't ask daddy. Didn't ask brother. Didn't go through. I see her. I want her. I'm taking her. Now, I don't know. That would probably be a pretty hard pill for daddy to swallow. Well, the prince, whatever you want to say about him, decides, you know what, I, I better make good here. I better do something. And after all, she's not just a one-night stand. I actually kind of, I'm not trying to be too plain for you, but that's what it was. I actually like her. I, as a matter of fact, I'm in love with her. I want to marry her. So now that I've done that, I guess I better go make it right. So he goes and he says, hey... Uh, could I have your daughter? And the two boys jump in. That's odd. What are the two boys doing speaking for daddy? That's strange. It's his daughter. It's their sister. And yet they connive a plan and then they say, listen, I'll tell you what we'll do. If you'll convert to our religion, uh, my altar's already in your neck of the woods anyway. And we, we kind of cohabitate together. I mean, I know y'all got your religion, we got ours, but they're like literally right next door to each other. So, you know, we're, we're all good, right? So here's what we'll do. If y'all will convert to our religion by being circumcised, here's what we'll do. We'll call it all good and then you can marry our sister Dinah. And then they take it back to Jake and Jake says... Sounds good to me, man. I mean, you know, I, I mean, after all, uh, she's already been messed up. I wonder if she'd have been messed up, Daddy, if you hadn't been where you shouldn't have been, Daddy. Amen. It's Father's Day. Just hang on a minute. I'm just simply saying, is it really Dinah's fault? They're, she's not running around out there with not enough clothes on to make a pair of britches for a blue jay. It doesn't say that. You know what you find that happens there is? She's in the land doing what she ought to be doing and apparently is a pretty good woman and the guy looks at her and says, Oh man. And before he even thinks, the act has occurred. Now probably knowing what a little bit I know of Jacob, he's probably thinking that ain't going to be good for my reputation, but if I could get her married off, who's going to know any, any different? And if... People that are under my roof think I'm compromising. If I can make them convert to my religion, then we can have a wedding and we'll all be one big happy family. Oh, but wait. On the third day of the circumcision, the Bible says when the men were sore, two boys took their swords, killed the king, killed the prince, and killed all the males. And watch, and took, and took all the women and children and all the cattle. Was that a dowry for Dinah? What is that? Because when Jacob says to them, now watch, watch, watch who Jacob, watch his flesh come up. You have made me to stink in the eyes of all the people around here. It's your fault I look this way. Wait a minute, Daddy. Is it possible that your altar to yourself is in the wrong place? Is it possible that the altar to your work, is it possible the altar to your sports, to your ambition, to your man cave? Is it possible that you ignoring your responsibility as a dad? Is it possible that Dinah has been hurt because of you? No. It's the prince. Well, the prince acted... For him, what's normal for their culture? Stay with me. That wasn't uncommon. A stranger in the land. He's the prince. He's next in line to be the king. He is entitled to anything there. Remember the days when Abraham was around and him and Sarah were out there and the king saw Sarah and said, I want her. 
and said, Abraham, I'd like to have her. She, he said, well, she's my sister. Skin for skin, all that a man hath, give her his life, right? And he said, well, she's my sister. And he says, okay, good, I want to marry her. And Abraham's like, uh-oh. Now what am I going to do? Well, honey, you know what? I guess you better make do and do the best you can. Take one for the team because uh, otherwise he's going to kill me. If he knows I'm your husband, he'll kill me to take you. So uh, we got a problem here. During the night, Ahimelech has a dream. The Lord comes to him and said, What in the cat hair are you doing taking another man's wife? And Ahimelech says in his dream, I ain't taking nobody's wife. He said, You are too, Sarah. He said, no, sir, that's his sister. He goes, well, that's kind of a play on words. That's his wife. That's why you saw him sporting in the field. And Ahimelech has enough sense as a heathen to say, oops, I didn't know. Next morning wakes up, has some people bring Abraham to him and said, you stinking, God-forsaken, good-for-nothing, self-preserving liar, you assuming that I would kill you and therefore you were going to sacrifice her, the most beautiful woman I've ever seen, in order to preserve yourself. Here, take this stuff and get out of here. I never want to see you again. Is it possible if we were to lay at the feet of responsibility because there is nothing in the passage that said Dinah was out there playing the part of a prostitute, Dinah was out there doing something, is it possible that she got assaulted because daddy had her in the wrong place at the wrong time? Because sometimes our sin has collateral damage and it is so in our families, men... You can't be accountable for everything they do. I will realize once they get out of the house, the father's not accountable for the prodigal any more than he's accountable for the elder brother. They're making their own decisions. Stay with me now. But you do need to understand that there's a lot of things that are between the lines in the passage that firmly fall upon the shoulders of, of uh, Jacob. And the reason they do is, is Jacob stopped short of where God wanted him to be no matter how inconvenient it would have been the price he paid. For now his daughter to have been assaulted, which she will never forget, and his two sons now being liars, cheaters, and murderers. And their retort to daddy, and the reason I believe what I'm reading into the passage is correct is, well, is she supposed to do that to our sister? I say no. And, they, and Jake don't even respond. He's like, well, you got a point there. I guess it's okay for you to commit murder to cover up what I did. You say, preacher, where would you get that? I, I think I remember a guy by the name of David. Saw a woman taking a bath, so on and so forth, right? And then didn't he kill Uriah, but he involved Joab in doing what needed to be done? And then wasn't as a result of that, his family wind up suffering, the baby died? Remember then later on what happened when Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab? And his daughter Tamar got assaulted. Are you staying with me? Yes. That wasn't Tamar's fault. You know why? Your King James Bible is very careful to note that Tamar wore the garments of a virgin. There was no question about Tamar's purity. It just happened that dad let somebody in that shouldn't have been there. Message about fathers or the lack thereof. So he builds an altar. You know what? Sometimes I've learned this, Brother TK. I've learned that we can take half measures and it can help to soothe or abate your conscience, but only for a while. I read my Bible a little bit. I prayed a little bit. I tagged the base on Sunday morning. I built there an altar where it was comfortable. A little bit of the world, a little world music, stuff, but I'm in church. A fellow said to me one time, he said, I don't go to church, people talk about you. And really, that's what keeps you out of church. People are going to talk about you to the day you're dead. Amen. They talk about you whether you know it or not. That's part of life. But you know what I've learned? I've learned, I've learned we can take a half measure and it makes you feel better for a little while, but not long. It's like taking a course of antibiotics. 
Doctor says take it for seven days. You take it three days, it's kind of like, man, I feel great. And then five days later, you're back in the doctor's office and you're worse than you were before. And he's like, first question he asked, did you take your medicine? Yeah, I took my medicine. Did you take the whole thing for all seven days? Well, oh, I get it. You've been to school. You know as much as the doctor does and you didn't need it for seven days. How's that working out for you? Well, okay. Just give me another thing of antibiotics. Well, here's the problem. Now I've got to give you something stronger and you've got to take it longer to do the same thing that would have happened if you hadn't have taken half measures. Amen. Shall we stop here or go on? I'm not to my Father's Day message yet. This is just the, this is the foyer. This is the entrance way. Now, if you come down to Genesis 35, and you'll have to check me on this because I'm not going to go back up to my notes right now. 20 years have gone by. 20 years at the wrong place, doing the wrong things, hanging with the wrong people. I say God's pretty gracious. 20 years, the Lord calls unto Jacob and he says, Arise and go to where? Isn't that where it started? I need you to go to Bethel, but watch and build T-H-E-R-E -E, an altar. You know why? Because God never recognized His altar in the other place. Because He was worshiping at a place that God never condoned His worship. He had an altar perversion. He had an ASV version. That just left out the importance of every word. God never condoned the building of the altar, but because God didn't strike the altar, you would think, oh, well, that must be everything is okay. Well, notice what he says here. I'm sure that you understand. He said, go up to Bethel and dwell there and make there an altar unto who? Almost makes you wonder if the altar that he built before wasn't to God in the first place. It was just sort of making Jake look good. Sometimes, you know, we might question our own attendance, fathers. We might look and say, is the only reason I'm here is because it makes me look good, or am I here because it's what God wants me to do? Does God recognize our worship? But that's another message. Let me just say this. He says that I need for you to do something. I need for you to take probably the hardest trip you're ever going to take. I need you to return to where it first started. You see, you've spent a long time, Jake, going down the wrong road and you're so far down, there's no cut across and catch me on the road. You're going to have to retrace your steps and go back and we're going to start all over. That's a hard trip. Mm -hmm. To admit I was wrong and I got to go back. I've come 20 years down the road. And the Lord said, yep, you've come 20 years down the road, the wrong road. Mm -hmm. Now... Let's go back where it started. I'm going to let everything that took place between you and Esau and everything else, I'm going to put that under the blood. We're going to start from where you said that you're going to be my God and I'll be your people. All that, I'm, going to, I'm right there. We're going to start here at Bethel. Where you saw angels ascending and descending, that's where we're going to go back to. I want you to go back there. You say, why? I need to jog your memory. That when you got up from there, instead of walking with me and talking with me, the second that you saw something that you wanted, you didn't even consult me. You didn't even ask me. You just said, that's it. You didn't ask me for protection. You didn't ask me for guidance. You didn't ask me for direction. You saw what you wanted like Eve saw the tree and you said, I'm going to take it. And you made a deal on your own to work seven years. If I'd have been in it, you may not have had to have a seven year courtship that turns to 14 years but Jake you're so smart you got it so well figured out that I just let you have your way and Jake I gotta be honest with you if it wasn't for all the stuff going on in life right now you know what you probably would never make it back to Bethel and that means that when what's coming in your life in the future you're not going to have my help to help you because you've decided to move in a different direction. 
make no mistake, gentlemen, the trip back is a lot harder than the trip forward. Amen. Being willing to turn around and go, why are you going backwards? Uh, because I got off the trail. Now you got GPSs now. But back in the day, you had a street guide and a map. And that's if you're in the city and stuff. And then if you went on a trip, you had to follow a map. And you know how we are as men, generally speaking, we don't want to ask anybody for directions. Come on, can I get a witness? You're, you're... That's why in most cases, most of your GPS people talking are women. It's payback. <laughs> oh, you don't want to ask your wife and you ain't pulling over at the gas station or go in the 7-Eleven, so guess what happens? You get lost. There is nothing worse than having to go back to the last place that was familiar to you and have somebody go, well, if you'd have just asked directions. <laughs> Jacob is the patriarch of his family. He's supposed to be the chief cook and bottle washer. He's the big dude on, cancel, on camp campus. And the Lord said, Jake, I'm not really impressed with all that. <laughs> we got to start over. I'm not talking about starting over to get resaved now. Right. Stay with me. But you know what he says to him? He said, until you get back where we started, you and I aren't going anywhere. But I want you to watch what happens. Jake says to his family, he said, we're going to go to Bethel. Oh, yeah, we've heard about that place and stuff like that. And, you know, that's a place where you <laughs> met God before. Had a great camp meeting, great revival meeting, you know, met Him at the altar. <laughs> we've heard about that. Yeah, well, we're going. And by the way, you ain't going like that. Look at it. It's in the passage. You know what he says? He says, there's the first thing that has to go. You've picked up some idols. Rachel was raised in a land of idol worship. And apparently that has now gone on. But if you read chapter number 33 and 34, you know what you find out? You find out that when those two boys went in there, they took the possessions of those people. So that means they picked up their ways and their gods. Amen. Idols. And now apparently, because Jake won't say anything about it, because, you know, religion is a choice for everybody to make on their own, and Daddy doesn't want to infringe on uh, anybody's rights, and certainly the husband doesn't want to tell the wife. I mean, you, you know, how, you, you understand how that is, right? I mean, you, that's, just the, that's the Jacob syndrome. So, well, you got to kind of let them choose, and you got to kind of let them make their way, and we don't want to be too hard on them. A quick illustration. I mentioned one time before that I believed, and just to a men's meeting, and I said, I believe that the husband should take the lead. I believe the father should take the lead in spiritual matters in the house. And if your wife already knows more about the Bible than you do, go to Bible school. Amen. Go to correspondence school. Learn something about the Bible so that you can learn how to take the lead. I believe that's a biblical precedent. And I went through everything and I said, and I believe that you ought to tell your kids where they're going to church until they're old enough to make that own decision. That means when they've moved out of your house. Right. Well, he came up at the break. And he's going to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Of course, there's people around. So he had an agenda. And he said, I just don't think it's uh, biblical for you to impose on their free will to choose. I said, okay. And I tried to let it go. And he goes, well, what say ye? I'm like, why are you using Bible words on me? You, you living in <laughs> old England or something? What say ye? I'm like, thus saith I. <laughs> I'm thinking, what planet are you from? I said, can I maybe answer a question with a, quench, uh, a question? Well, sure, if you think you can. I said, um, you have a teenage daughter, I think, 15, 16, something like that, 16. I said, uh, you let her date who she wants. That's different. I said, you let her go wherever she wants. That's different. I said, let me just change the subject. I can tell that's a little touchy for you there with your teenage daughter. I said, you have a couple other kids, right? I said, they go to school. Yes, they go to school. They're, I, we wouldn't be, okay, okay, got it. They go to school. Do you let them go when they want to? That's different. I said, when the kids come home, do you let them do homework if they want to? That's different. I said, I've made my point. You want to interfere in everything in their personal life 
and every decision they make from get up to get gone, and yet you're telling me you're a biblical father by letting them choose where they should go to church. I said, you're a hypocrite, sir, with all due respect. Amen. And I said, you feel guilty about it, and that's why you're confronting me with it. And I'm here to tell you that you should do what you're doing in their personal life, in the individual life. And if they don't like it, then sooner or later they move out and they do their own thing and make their own mistakes. But while they're under your roof, I didn't get a lot of amens there. Because we're living in a Jacob society. With all due respect, men, you put the pressure on the women to make the decisions for the kids so that you're always the good guy. Your shoulders are broader and your back is stronger. And you're made to take the hits for being the ogre that says, we are going to church. In the book of Acts, when the apostle Paul is down there beaten, he's in the prison and so on and so forth, and the jailer comes out and going to Philippian jailer is going to kill him and all that. And we're in about Acts 16 there, and the gates open up, and Paul comes out there, and they wind up getting to talk to that individual, and the man of the house gets saved before the family. Now I know that flies in the face of modern theology, Grandpa. You want so bad to have the grandkids like you that come Sunday you'd rather run off to them to the fun park or go to Disney World or something with them instead of having them in church and saying, we'll go after church. Yeah. Come on. Amen. 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 You know what? The, they're not ashamed of an altar. They're not afraid of an altar. They know what an altar, but it looks like they've never been to one. You say, why? They're not ready to go. they got too many other gods. So he says, give me the gods. Now notice he also says earrings. Now I'm not going to preach on earrings and all that other kind of stuff, but I'm going to say this to you. Earrings in the Old Testament was a sign that you were wholly given to somebody. It was a sign of being in servitude or slavery to another individual. Your owner had a ring in your ear because he, owed you, he owned you. And if you were sold out to a religion, you wore certain earrings that said, I'm sold out to Baal. I'm sold out to this idol, that idol. So when he says, take your earrings, he's not just saying you should never wear jewelry as I've heard preached, and that's why he said that. No, he's saying that your idol worship has led to your physical following of these things, and it is something that displeases me because you can't worship me and have another God. I think that's one of the top ten, isn't it, Brother Jerry? Thou shalt have no other before me. And then he says, you need to change your clothes. Now, before you get a pants pork message out of this, you need to understand something. The way they were dressed was worldly attire that was accepted by the group they were around. It was the norm. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was, you know, hot pants or skinny jeans. I, I got no idea. I just know this. I know that to come worship God, they didn't want them going looking like they were Baal worshipers. I know how old-fashioned I sound, and I can tell there is a hush that just went across. Preacher, I was right there with you. We was tracking. But now, I don't see a problem with yoga pants to church. You should just accept me like I am. I'm just reading the Bible. You should just be glad we're here. I'm just reading the Bible. Why are you making me uncomfortable? Oh, I, oh, I get it. Because Daddy and Papa agree. So the preacher, how dare him bring something like that? It wasn't just for the women. It was the men too. Yep. He said, you need to make some changes. Now, what is in the passage that you, you have, you're expected to kind of have enough sense to see is you don't put on clean clothes over dirty skin. So, so basically what he's fixing to say to him there is, is you need a bath. Because just changing the outer garment don't take the smell away. There's a little grace preaching there. I, that, that could be real good because you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and therefore and then you get the robe and all that other kind of stuff. But, but if, you want, if you want to notice something, I don't know about you, but if I am working outside and I do wind up getting into a sweat or whatever, I, I go take a bath before I put my suit on. That's out of respect, not just for my suit, but out of respect for my wife. She's kind of like, baby, you've got on clean clothes, but you stink. 
Or if I'm going to eat with you at a restaurant and all of a sudden you're like, Preacher, you look real nice. You got on three-piece suit, man. You look really sharp. But man, I'm about to gag a maggot here. I can't get my food down because you stink. Because you see, the outward appearance, he's trying to say to you, it's not the outward appearance that matters, but there are some things you should do to make yourself somewhat presentable to show that you've made an effort to change. Yes, Amen. 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 That's all it is. It's just I'm making an effort. I don't, I'm not talking about tie or blue jeans or all that other kind. I'm saying just trying to make an effort to show. Here's an odd thing to me when it comes to this thing and I'm uncomfortable with it because I know how people generally read it. But for years, I put people in jail of all walks of life that did everything you can maybe possibly imagine, as well as some of these other people. And the oddest thing to me was is that I would walk into a courtroom sometimes two, three, or six months later and sit down and they would ask me this question. Do you recognize the person that you arrested on such and such a date and such and such a time? And you look over to the defense table and you're like, I mean, clean shaven? Nice suit of clothes, wearing a tie, got their hair slicked back. And I'm thinking, and I made the mistake one time and I said, that's the guy, but he didn't look like that when I, and man, that gavel came down, man, and rattled my teeth and the guy objected, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. But it's interesting when we're trying to preserve ourselves or show up for a wedding, how we can make the change. Amen. We just had a wedding here and it's customary for the bride to have on white. And that's fine, I'm not saying, but it's interesting how we'll change our outward appearance for what matters to us. Amen. I had an occasional meeting with some of the higher ups. I would always go into the drill hall. There was a big full length mirror there that says, does your appearance command respect? And I'd walk and stand in front of the mirror and make sure that my shoes were polished with something other than a Hershey bar. <laughs> make sure that my gig line was straight. You say, why? You're just trying to impress people? No, out of respect for the people I was going to meet. Amen. Out of respect for the people I was going to meet. I didn't walk in in jeans and a t-shirt. Out of respect for the people I was going to meet. Is it a fair statement to say that it looks as if Jake's household was anything but in order? Is it a fair statement to say he'd gotten kind of a little loose with his religion? And that it looks like the relationship that he started at Bethel was no longer there. He was just going through the motions. Is that a fair, that a fair statement? Twenty years of being in the far country had taken its toll on him. But he still had a little religion. They bury him under an oak. For those of you that struggle with ungodly and wicked things in your past. The list is endless. The indicator is, is that all the things you used to do are under the blood. They're buried, not intended for you to go dig them up anymore. They're buried. Amen. Amen. So leave them buried and don't let them identify you anymore when you go to church. Amen. And anybody when you show up at church says, hey, aren't you the one that you know what you say? It's buried under the oak of Calvary. Mm -hmm. Leave me alone. I'm here to get some help now. Yes. Amen. And they hightail it. They get to Bethel. And you can look in the passage. I can recall it from mind. And the Lord meets with Jacob again but not until Jacob was willing to retrace his steps. So it's Father's Day. But as long as the father was out of whack for 20 years, the rest of the family was unstable. Two boys were murderers. Matter of fact, you read a little bit further. Reuben was the oldest. Right? Later on they called him unstable as water. But you know what happens to Reuben? That curse continues down because Reuben wants somebody so bad that he goes into his father's concubine. 
Read it. It's in the Bible. He doesn't hide anything from you. And then you read the parallel passages. You know what you find out? He lost his birthright because he wanted what he wanted when he wanted it and it belonged to somebody else. Oh, hello, Jake. Your boy kind of messed up there, didn't he? Wonder if he took on daddy's attributes. I'm going to take what I want when I want it. It's not long before japes and the rigors and the toys of life and Rachel comes up and has a little boy named Ben. Benoni, she calls him a child of my sorrow. Benjamin, child of my right hand, meaning Rachel's my right hand and he loses the one that he loved the most. There's no mention of Leah just the one that he loved. Well, you know the story. You know what winds up happening and the deception that continues on and continues on until Jape comes in and says, few and evil have been the years of my pilgrimage. You say, oh, all because he didn't go back earlier. He had to suffer the repercussions of decisions he made during the far country. A quick illustration in Luke 15, you don't have to turn there. The Bible doesn't say how old the prodigal son was. But he had to be old enough to obtain the inheritance that he asked for. So according to Jewish custom, he was at least old enough to be recognized as a man and therefore was able to ask for his inheritance early. That would mean the elder brother got two-thirds and he got one-third. And he took it right then. So I don't know how old he is, but old enough to make the decision. And instead of dad stopping him, dad said, okay, you're old enough now to make the decision and you can do what you want to do. And off he went into the far country, spent his money on riotous living. And then one day he's sitting in the pig pen and he says a strange thing. Here's the hard trip. Here's the altar. He tried to build an altar out there in the far country and tried to get along with the world and so on and so forth, wound up in the pig pen. And now all of a sudden the Bible says, and he came to himself. In a sense, he said, you know what, i got to get back to where I started because I messed up when I left. And I've been on the wrong road a long time. And now I've spent all the money, but more importantly, I realize now I was wrong. And it never was about money or possessions or people. It was about being in fellowship with my father because I know that my father has servants that have bread enough to eat. And the way I've been acting, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. You mean a name change? You mean like Jacob, whose name was changed from thief and liar and surplanter to Israel. Amen. And he said, I will arise and go to my father's house. I'm going back to Bethel. I'm going back to the Father's house. What are you going to do when you get back there, man? You going to eat, drink, and be married? No. I'm going to take a shower and get cleaned up? No. I got some business to attend to. Yeah, what's that? <laughs> I've sinned against heaven, against God, and against my Father. And Living how I've lived, I'm not even worthy to be called a son, even though I'm given that by birthright. I'm not going to put that on my daddy. I'm just going to ask him, can I have a job as one of your hired servants? I'm not asking to live in the big house. I'm not asking to be recognized as a son. Don't, I'm not looking for anything. I just want to be back in the father's house. You know, the father loved me and cared about me. Let me make a stupid decision. And he got up. And he got out. And he went back. To where he messed up. And got off the track. And the picture is, is that the Lord is a picture of that father. And when he sees you coming across the horizon and coming back to the house, 
He's more interested in your mindset when you got up out of the pig pen than he is in what you say once you get there. Because he can already tell you've been clothed now with humility and you're willing to say, I was wrong. What happened with the prodigal, in a sense, is what happens when we get back on the right track. The Bible says that there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. People say that's just salvation. Can I ask you this question? Do you not think that the father was glad to see his son back? He's rejoicing over somebody that never has quit being his son. He just came home. I think the Lord is really glad to know that people get saved. But I kind of think he's a little bit prejudicial in that when one of his sheep leaves the flock, when one of his sons leaves the house, it maybe bothers him a little more than when a lost person just keeps doing the things they've been doing being lost. I think it grieves him as it would us if somebody in our own family left compared to grieving over someone from another family. It may hurt us, but not like it would if it was your own. Sometimes they make God emotionless. Yet there's so many stories that invoke emotion in the Bible. Do you think that that father, when he saw the son coming down, that that screen door didn't burst open and he didn't go running down the path as much as he possibly could? And the Bible says it wasn't one of these, hey son, how you doing? It was a full-blown embrace, man. I mean, hugging him, holding on to him, as filthy and dirty as he was. And he turns to his servant and he says, kill the fatted calf and get her a robe. You're going to get a robe and get some shoes. My son who was dead, he's alive now. Let's go out and let's celebrate. Do you think that there was no emotion in that? Do you think there was not a tear that may have been caught? Forcing down his cheek. Do you think there was not great joy in his heart when he was able to go back home and say, Honey, honey, our boy's home. Our boy's home. Hey, we're going to have a celebration. Our boy's home. He was lost. He's found. Uh, he was dead. He's alive. We know where he is. Hey, hey, honey, don't you think? Don't you think? Do you think there might have been some emotion? Amen. I think there's the same emotion now. Oh, yeah, Peacock, he's back again. No, I think when I come back, the Lord makes me know how glad He is I came back. And He doesn't keep reminding me of how many times I left. He greets me at the door. He doesn't say, you again. Lord, son, I'm going to run out of robes and rings around here as much as you leave. He said, I'm glad you're home, boy. Let's do better next time. Yes. Yes. You know what I'm saying to you on this Father's Day? I think fathers should lead the charge to the altar because guess what? Jacob has to take his family to the altar and he has to show them things they have not already learned. You say, oh, so he showed them about the sacrifice and he showed them how to pour the oil. And he said, no. No, you missed it. He showed them that when you come back to the altar, you have to humble yourself and admit you were wrong. If you want God to bless your sacrifice, the longest trip you ever make is not with the gifts that you're bringing. It's with you yourself having to admit you messed up. He taught them what that altar meant, a place of surrender. Not a place of, Lord, I'm, I'm giving you my lamb. After all, isn't that what you require? No, it's like, Lord, I am so sorry this lamb has to be sacrificed for my foolishness again. Because I was wrong. And the Lord says it costs you something, but it's not going to cost you. Now for you and I as Christians, it's Father's Day. You should be grateful for your fathers. You should be grateful that you have them. If you had a bad one, you got a heavenly father now. Amen. But some of you, you need to get back to Bethel. You know why? Because you've been going down the wrong road a long time. And you're not quite doing what you ought to be doing. And you're not setting the standard like it ought to be set. And it's for good reason things have gotten in the way. I, I know you've been busy and you got this going and that going and something's more important than church and more important than the altar. That, Jake did that for 20 years he did that. 
I don't know if the Lord would have said to him, Jake, that's it, or he may not have said, you know what, that's enough, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm through. I don't know when that cup of grace runs out. But I wouldn't want to take the chance. If God spoke to me, I'd want to say, I'm going back to Bethel. I'll say this for Jake, that old lion, stinking conniver, he knew something was missing. And when God said, arise and go, you know what he did? He made haste to get it done. And he didn't care how far it was that he had to go. He was willing to go the distance. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Men are already coming. God spoke to you. You want to come, come. Joni's going to play something softly on the piano. God spoke to you, come. What a great way to show your family you mean business. Father's Day. Lead them. Well, I'm a single mom, but I'm... Okay, good. Then you take the role of the father if you don't have a good one. God spoke, you come. They're coming. They're coming.